Uh, this is the second part of a We're Doing It Over Skype because we're in quarantine because of Corona Trilogy. And the song is Soldier of Three Armies. This is part two of Soldier of Three Armies. Now, as you can see, I am not in Germany at the studio because of Corona. I am at my home in Stockholm in my living room. My friend Ryan is filming me. Say hi, Ryan. Hello. The lighting is whatever lights we have lying around. So here we go. The winter war between Finland and the Soviet Union came to its end in March 1940. It had ended with the Finns successfully preserving their independence, but they still found themselves between a rock and a hard place. Many Finns found it hard, if not impossible, to believe that Joseph Stalin would keep his word and that this was closer to a temporary ceasefire than a lasting peace. In the West, the German war machine was on the move, taking Denmark and Norway. Sweden had kept its neutrality, but had to allow German troops transit rights through its territory. How long could Finland remain independent? In January 1941, Finnish Army Chief of Staff Erik Heinrichs visited Germany to get a clear answer. German High Command assured him that an invasion of Finland was not in their interest but Adolf Hitler did have a role for Finland to play in a new endeavor, the invasion of the Soviet Union. Thinking that they barely had a choice, they agreed to assist the German war effort, but only under certain conditions. Finland was to be a co-belligerent, not an actual ally. It would not join the tripartite pact, seeing war against the Soviets as separate from World War II, and would only open hostilities to achieve Finnish interests and revenge. For the moment, this was good enough for Hitler. Lauri Tarni had remained in the Finnish army after the Winter War. Word came that this new cooperation offered Finnish veterans the opportunity to train and serve in the German military. See, to many, that was reminiscent of the Great War, when Finnish volunteers had trained in the Imperial German Army, which later founded the Finnish Jäger movement. Those Jägers had served as the backbone of the victorious whites in the Finnish Civil War. Many of those veterans were now part of the higher officer corps and organized the transfer of young volunteers to do the same thing. German high command, however, insisted that the Finns not be trained by the regular German army, but by the Waffen SS. The Waffen SS had evolved as the militarized arm of the regular SS, the notorious instrument of Nazi power. The Nazis saw the Waffen SS as not only the most elite military force, but also as the bearer of Germanic and Nordic culture in concert with National Socialist ideology. So it welcomed men from the Nordic countries into its rank. Lauri Tarni, now a first officer, was among the 1400 volunteers that made their way to Germany. What motivated Tarni was not Nazi ideology or the prospect of fighting for Germany. He was a soldier, not a politician nor an idealist. He hated communism, he hated the Soviets who had invaded his homeland and even taken his family home, but there is no evidence that he endorsed fascism of any kind. It was for him an opportunity to train alongside what, what many saw as the elite of Europe, a cadre full of highly motivated and determined young men, equipped with the best weapons and trained by the best commanders. Or so he thought. He reached Germany in mid-June 1941 and was then sent to Vienna. Now wearing the death's head and the black uniform of an Untersturmführer, he began a brutal training regimen that honed his skills as a light infantry leader. But when Germany invaded the Soviet Union and Finland reopened the Northern Front against the Soviets, Tarni wanted to join the fight, not for Germany, but for Finland. After seven weeks of harsh training, his contingent was sent back to the Baltic coast to await its deployment on the Eastern Front. Now here, the stories differ. One source says that Tarni was designated too problematic and sent back to Finland. Another says he smuggled himself on board a ship. Either way, by late July, Lauri Tarni found himself back in Finland and immediately headed for Karelia. The Finnish army was advancing deep into Soviet Karelia, taking back the territory Finland had lost in the Winter War. Tarni now joined up with the 8th Light Infantry of the 1st Division. He made good use of his Waffen SS training and was even assigned to lead a unit of captured Soviet tanks. Soon he was seen driving far ahead, throwing grenades into the Soviet lines. 
The first six months of the Continuation War, as it would be called, went well for the Finns. Vipari, Tarni's hometown, was liberated and his family returned to their old home. By then, the Finnish army had pushed far into Soviet territory. Many hailed them as liberators from the communist yoke, but, you know, there was also the realization that they were the aggressors now. The Germans urged them on further to close the siege of Leningrad, but Finnish commander-in-chief Mannerheim refused. They had advanced enough and would instead create a new defensive line. In December 1941, two years after fighting the Winter War, Tarni once again led infiltration and reconnaissance missions deep into the enemy lines. Crossing frozen lakes and skiing through the snowy countryside, they bypassed Soviet outposts, trying to locate their supply depots instead. Tarni led a team of highly skilled veterans, demolitionists, sharpshooters, hand-to-hand -hand combat specialists. His men proudly sewed an orange T on their uniforms, identifying themselves as part of Detachment Tarni. Tarni himself was becoming a living legend. He was already widely respected as an unconventional but highly capable leader, and stories abounded, like how he once stumbled across a position of Soviet soldiers and killed all 30 of them with only his Suomi submachine gun. The gun, it was said, was as unpredictable as its wielder. But even the enemy knew his name. Soviet propaganda frequently broadcast that they wanted Lauri Tarni dead or alive. The bounty on his head was soon raised to three million Finnish marks. Started out as a reserve, soon promoted well deserved, and the legend has begun. With the bounty on his head, the red army wants him dead, so he has been me number one. By March 1944, though, it had become pretty clear that the German army was facing collapse on the Eastern Front, and even the siege of Leningrad had been lifted. It was only a matter of time, and Finland needed a way out. For months, Finnish politicians tried to get Stalin to agree to a new peace treaty, but no dice. Now the Soviets were becoming more aggressive. The more ground the Germans lost, the more the pressure on the Finnish front increased. Then in June, Finland once more saw itself against overwhelming odds as a huge Soviet offensive began to knock the Finns out of the war. Over 10,000 pieces of Soviet artillery opened up on Finnish positions all over the Karelian Isthmus. Tarni was, as always, in the thick of fighting. Moving from division to division, his unit served as a fire brigade, counterattacking the Soviets wherever they broke through. Despite irreplaceable casualties, the Finns held once more. However, this was not sustainable. But after Finnish chief diplomat in Moscow, Juho Pasekivi, openly warned that, we will shoot from behind every stone and tree. We will go on shooting for 50 years. We are not Czechs, we are not Dutchmen. We will fight tooth and nail behind every rock and over the ice of every lake. The Soviets were finally willing to speak of peace on condition that Finland would not only immediately break any relations with Germany and extradite all German personnel from Finland at once, the other conditions for peace were about as harsh as the terms after the Winter War, which we saw in part one. But unconditional surrender was avoided. On September 7th, the treaty was signed. Finland once more retained its independence. In the middle of all this, Lauri Tarni had learned that he was to be honored as a Knight of the Mannerheim Cross for his natural and resourceful leadership during the war. This was Finland's highest military honor for valor and gallantry. Hitler, of course, took Finland's separate peace with scorn and ordered the German soldiers retreating through Lapland towards Norway to scorch the earth behind them. But this was not the end of cooperation between Finland and Germany. The Gestapo, the German secret police, was already starting a new operation called Sonderkommando Nord. This was to assist the Finnish underground that was forming among Finnish veterans. With a secret radio network and weapons deliveries, Finland was to be prepared for guerrilla operations against any Soviet takeover. And while many Finns distrusted the peace, communist influence was growing rapidly in Finland, and Soviet agents and spies were everywhere. It seemed like only a matter of time until Finland would need its soldiers once again. Although Nazi Germany was on the verge of collapse, 
The Gestapo offered to train Finnish veterans for secret operations. Tarni, always restless, agreed and by the beginning of January 1945, boarded a German submarine that would take him to the secret training camp. From January to March, Finnish SS and German Gestapo officers taught the volunteers secret communications techniques, coding and encryption, and advanced sabotage and demolition techniques. Training, though, was interrupted by the rapid Soviet advance and was relocated to the Danish border. Tony stayed there till April, and then here again, the stories differ. One story goes that to escape the Soviets, he made contact with one of Felix Steiner's detachments that were unable to break through to Berlin and instead surrendered to the British. Later, he escaped imprisonment and made his way back to Finland. Another story goes that he grew disillusioned with the Germans and felt deceived. He then escaped the training camp and with false papers made his way through Denmark and Sweden to Finland. Again, either way, by late 1945, Tarni was once again back in Finland, back in civilian life. The warrior came home, for now. But his story does not end here, for he was a soldier of three armies, and this was but the second. Now this episode is a little more, I'm not going to say serious, because since all of your songs are military history, they all obviously cover serious topics of life and death. But it's a little darker, and I know it's a little more controversial because of the specific subject matter of who Lowry was fighting with. But before we talk about this, you said you've actually been to his grave, right? Yes, I've been to Arlington. Uh, I said once or twice, I can't remember actually. Well, yeah, I had to go and... You know, search in the computer to find his uh, lot number, and uh, man, there's a lot of grades, a lot of dead soldiers there. Yeah, um, you know, I've never actually been. You'd think it as a historian and a military historian, that'd be a place that'd be a big on my bucket list, but uh, I never. And that an American. Part of the that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, now, question. Now, what they might not know because we haven't mentioned it. It's going to be mentioned in part three. Um, later in life, after the things that happened in this episode, Lauri Torni changes his name to Larry Thorne, right? Yeah. Uh, when he, and of course he's buried in Arlington because he did some service with America. It's not too much of a spoiler to say that, that he did stuff with the Americans. Um, is his, does his grave say Lauri Torni, Lauri Alan Torni, or is it just Larry Thorne or what is it? Larry say? Thorne. Uh, yeah. maybe there was something I can't remember now, but maybe, maybe we got a clip of that. Uh, okay. Somewhere. Yeah, let's see it. Well, here we are. Larry Allen Thorne. So is that something you or or the whole band or some of the band does a lot? Like I know I know you visit military sites, but particularly memorials and graveyards and stuff? Uh, yes and no. I mean, we did a whole lot in Redon, actually, yeah, when we were there. Sure. Um, I love to see these places. Uh, it's a matter of respect, you know, yeah. especially if we, if it's people we sung about. Uh, yeah. But also, at the same time, I don't want, really want to do it on a show day. It's a bit of a party pooper. <laughs> if you know oh, what yeah. I mean. uh, but Arlington seemed, you know, it's, I would recommend anyone who is in the D.C. area to go there. I wouldn't say travel from halfway around the world to see Arlington, but if you're in the area, I'd say it's a, one of the bucket list uh, things to do. Artie Murphy there, you've got JFK, and right. I mean, thousands upon thousands of graves, and uh, the grave of the unknown soldier, which is still being watched, even though uh, of the coronavirus, I saw actually on the news. And which is right. interesting is we did the... Uh the diary of an unknown soldier two weeks ago that episode came out so it's pretty oh, yeah. recent for us so anybody out there that didn't see it it's a it's a pretty good episode about how the whole concept of memorializing the unknown soldier as an everyman came out but hey interesting point um you say you don't want to do it you know when you're on tour and when you have when it's a day when it's a show day if you have a let's say you have a a, a tour from march 1st to march 31st through south america how many free days would you have in a 31 day i mean is it like only four or five, or is it like 12 or 13? 
Ah, that would depend. Uh, if we were on a tour bus uh, on a month, we would do about 22, 23, 25 shows maybe, usually. Okay. We do yeah. average about five shows per week. If we're going to do Russia or South America, it's a lot of fly shows. So uh, that means the uh, days off are also travel days. And sometimes when you travel in between, you have to connect uh, in some main airport hubs. So sure. there will be a, a bit fewer. I think one month, in South America, we're talking 18 to 20. Okay, well, that's cool. So, yeah, you could spend, you know, 10 days looking at war memorials. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving everybody ideas, you know, that's me, making them always think that that's my job in life. Um, but, hey, back to something else I wanted to ask you about. A lot of people view it as controversial that Finland fought the continuation war, not as an ally of Nazi Germany, but as a co-belligerent. Some don't, some do. I, I, it makes perfect sense to me. I mean, Soviet Union had invaded Finland. Germany was actually the only European country that had treated Finland decently in any way during the Winter War. France and England were, they were real jerks. If you, uh, if you go to my World War II channel and follow the Winter War, you'll see that the people that were supposed to be supporting them failed to support them. But I understand also because it, it is Nazi Germany, it is Adolf Hitler's Germany, and people say, how can you ally yourself to such monsters? Although it wasn't entirely apparent until after the invasion of the Soviet Union what monsters they actually were. But what do you what do you say about that? You know, well, in a in a sense, it doesn't really matter because we're we're storytellers, not commentators on these things. I mean, we're not doing this to spread any propaganda to say what's right or wrong. We we want to tell the most interesting stories right. uh, from the most the, or the point of view we find the most interesting. And in this yeah. case, I would have to say. Laurea Lanterni really qualifies because, you know, what he did in his life as a soldier uh, really qualifies him to be, a, you know, especially the stuff soldier. this week, you know, the stuff that we heard about today, we're like going to Germany and getting trained and not being in the, you know, the Germans not having them trained by the army, but by the Waffen SS. And I, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> it gets weird. You know, I think, I think this one, this, this episode is definitely going to inspire people to dig around and dig a little deeper into it. Let's save the rest of the stuff we have to say about Lauri Alantoni or Larry Thorne until part three of, what's the name of this song? Soldier of Three Armies. See you next time. Take care. All right, everyone. Thank you very much for watching and thank you so much for the support with the community. All the Patreons, everyone who's helping sharing this. We really love doing this and thanks to you, we can keep on doing it. So. Keep on doing what you do, and we will keep on doing what we do. Thank you.